Change comes hard for people. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> My name is Art Youngsma. I'm a Christian who has been saved by grace alone. I'm one of the founding members of the board of All One Body. I'm a member of Calvin CRC here in Grand Rapids. And I'm a retired clinical psychologist. But finally, I'm a male created by God to be heterosexual. Which means to some Christians, I have been exclusively selected by God to be approved to enjoy all the benefits of marriage. Same-sex oriented Christians are totally excluded by God from this privilege of marriage, according to these folks. Is that exclusionary understanding compatible with God's perfect mercy and justice? That's the question that brings us together tonight. All of us with all one body want to warmly welcome all of you here. We're thrilled with filling this auditorium. It's going to be an exciting meeting. We've looked forward to it, and we're extremely proud to sponsor Dr. Waldersdorf's speech. And we've looked forward to this with eager anticipation for several months. It was on the evening of June 15 that Dr. Waldersdorf finally gave in to my badger. <laughs> to present his thoughts on the LGBT subject. I remember that date well. Maybe some of you know that date. That was the date that the synods debated the majority and minority report of their study committee on pastoral guidance regarding same-sex marriage. I met Dr. Waldersdorf that night in the lobby of the Kelvin Fine Arts Center as we were both leaving very disheartened after listening to the process and outcome of that debate. I tapped him on the shoulder and quickly introduced myself and asked him if he was now ready to speak. <laughs> the timing is everything. He immediately said, yes, send me that email again. Send it to me tomorrow. I got home, I sent it to him right away. <laughs> and here we are, four months later, gathered for his important words. <laughs> You're all invited to stay after Dr. Waldersdorf's speech to have refreshments down below and take the stairways. There will be cookies, bars, fruits, veggies, coffee, and soft drink for your enjoyment while you chat with old and new friends. You may have found a three by five card on your seat that was provided so you may write a question or comment for Dr. Wallersdorf. We'll allow time for discussion when he finishes his presentation. If a question occurs to you while he's speaking or after he's finished, please write it down. Someone from All One Body will pick up your card if you hold it up high. A moderator will select some cards we may not be able to cover all, all questions to read to Dr. Wallersdorf for his consideration and response. We ask that no unauthorized audio or video recording take place during tonight's presentation. We are making an effort to stream this video live with Facebook right now. So I'm speaking to millions. <laughs> And we'll record it later to try to post to YouTube. I ask you to silence all of those things that go bump in the night <laughs> and ring a ding and all that. But please join me now in a word of prayer. 
God of grace and God of justice. We gather tonight as your children who hold to the authority of Scripture. We rely on your special revelation to guide us in gaining an understanding of your will for us as your followers and members of your church. Tonight, we especially seek to understand your path of justice for those whom you've created as same-sex attracted and who also confess your Son as Savior and Lord and who seek to serve him in their daily lives and who desire to live in a covenantal marriage bond just as those of us who were born opposite sex attracted. <coughs> Cause your spirit to descend on this gathering tonight so we may better comprehend your love, mercy, and justice. Holy Spirit, be present in a powerful way in the mind and heart and words of Dr. Waldersdorf as he speaks to us of his understanding of your way of truth. In the strong name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> the online Body Board has asked Dr. Clarence Jolersma, a professor in the Graduate Education Department of Calvin College, to introduce Dr. Waldersdorf. Dr. Jolersma is very familiar with Dr. Wal Walterstorff's Christian philosophical work on justice. He has applied it himself to the Christian school setting in a recent speech and article in the International Journal of Christianity and Education. And that article is entitled, Doing Justice Today, a Welcoming Embrace for LGBT Students in Christian Schools. Please welcome. Dr. Clarence Jolderson. If I had known I was going to get an introduction like that, I would have dressed up. <laughs> well, it's with great pleasure that I introduce Nicholas Walter Stark. He grew up as part of a working class family in a Christian Reform Bond play in a small town in Minnesota. Although later becoming a world-renowned philosopher, he never abandoned those sturdy Minnesotan roots. His generous spirit, genuine interest in others, has remained a central trait through his life's journey, from Chimes editor as a student at Calvin College to a longtime faculty member at that same place to New Haven. Although sort of retired, he remains no Porter Professor Emeritus of Philosophical Theology at Yale University. His vast scholarship has rightly given him international renown, with a CV running over 24 pages, including 16 books and counting. His first book on universals got attention of the philosophers and those that followed, books with names like Reason Within the Bounds of Religion, Art in Action, Divine Discourse, showed talent, his talent in working in divergent areas, including political philosophy, epistemology, religion, aesthetics, philosophy of art, education. Being chosen to present the Gifford Lectures in Scotland and the Wild Lectures in Oxford is the distinction few philosophers attain. But his best-selling book remains Lament for a Son, a moving testimony to the worth of a loved one lost. It gives us a peek into the humanity of the man behind this considerable intellect. As he might tell us tonight, in the early 80s, he was deeply touched by two experiences, leading him to recognize that the cultural mandate was not enough, but that the liberation mandate was equally important. Justice and Shalom became a cornerstone of his thinking, especially in his work as a Christian public intellectual. My first sustained connection with him occurred when he Gloria Strunks and I edited two volumes of his essays, one on Christian day schools and the other on Christian higher education. I remember with, remember with some trepidation writing a critical introduction to the Shalom book in which I attempted to summarize the thread of justice that ran through 25 years' worth of his essays. But generous spirit that he is, Nick assured me that it was an excellent introduction. 
After his retirement, I have occasion to renew my contact through, a, through yearly drives to Toronto for meetings. On one trip, I remember asking him what he was working on, and he replied, oh, a small book on justice. I have long wanted to write. The next year, I asked him how it was coming, and he replied, oh, it's getting away on me. It's becoming a really big book. <laughs> A year later, he responded, the book is finally done. It was justice, rights, and wrongs. And then he said, but I have all these notes left over, which became the book Justice and Love. A few years later, I think it was at a summer lunch we had in East Town, uh, he remarked, Clarence, you won't believe it. I'm writing a third book on justice. Indeed. Now, the first two are fine volumes, but if you want to hear most clearly the journey of justice in the life of Nicholas Walterstorff, read Journey Toward Justice. Just like in the Goldilocks story, the third book is just right. <laughs> His talk today is entitled Biblical Justice, the Missing Component in the Same-Sex Marriage Discussion. So let's welcome Nicholas Walterstorff to the book. same-sex marriage, or about homosexuality more generally. And the only thing I've written on the topic is the analysis I wrote for the banner last spring of the committee report on same-sex marriage presented to the CRC Synod of last June. And the reason I haven't written on the matter is that I have not made myself an authority on the topic. I've always thought that there were others who could speak more authoritatively than I could. But a good many people have urged me, nonetheless, to speak out, one of those being <laughs> Irish Youngsman and Grace and Clarence Jones are here. So tonight I will. Given that I'm not an authority, and I'm still not an authority, I won't cast what I have to say in the mode of this is how all well-informed, right and Christians should think about these matters. Instead, I'm going to speak more or less autobiographically. I'm going to narrate what has led me to be a supporter of same-sex marriage. Now, identify what I see as the main issues. So I feel a little bit uncomfortable standing in a pulpit. <laughs> <laughs> With all its symbolism of authority. Um, so I'm not speaking authoritatively. <laughs> Before I set out, let me make the following comment. When men speak on behalf of women, when whites speak on behalf of African Americans, when well-to-do people speak on behalf of the poor, they often say things that make the people on whose behalf they are speaking wins. And probably that will be true tonight when I, as a heterosexual person, speak on behalf of homosexual persons. So I ask forgiveness in advance. I grew up in Bigelow and Edgerton, Minnesota, with traditional views on these matters. And the change from those views to my present views has been gradual, stretching over many years. There was never there's never been a Damascus Road experience. So when I look back, I ask myself, and what basically led to my change of views? I think two things mainly. First, I discovered that I had relatives who were gay. And I learned that some of my students and former students were gay. And I've also, over the years, I've come to know people who are living in committed same-sex relationships, in some cases, they're married. And I've listened to these people, to their agony, to their feelings of exclusion and oppression, 
to their longings, to their expressions of love, to their commitments, to their faith. So listening has changed me. And secondly, I followed in a layman sort of way the studies of sexuality that have appeared over the past 40 or 50 years. And these have gradually led me to think of homosexuality very differently from how I thought of it previously. The first thing that changed in my thinking was the distinction, that now seems obvious, between sexual orientation and sexual activity. Originally, I did not make that distinction, nor did most other people. For 50 years now, something like that, the distinction has, in fact, been accomplished. Having made that distinction between orientation and activity, initially I thought of sexual orientation, looking back, in a very binary way. There are those who have a heterosexual orientation, and there are those who have a homosexual orientation. But as I understand the evidence of multiple studies, that's not the right way to think about it. Instead, we're dealing, the studies tend to show, with a continuum. And on one end of the continuum are those whose orientation is entirely heterosexual. Next to them is, are those whose orientation is dominantly heterosexual, but who feel some same-sex attraction. Then in the middle there are those who are bisexual, then those whose orientation is dominantly homosexual, but not entirely and exclusively so, and finally the other end, those whose orientation is entirely homosexual. And in addition, of course, there are the transgender people who feel that they were born into a body, born with a body, of their own sex. Now, so far as I know, every, everyone agrees that one does not choose where one is located on that continuum of sexual orientation. It's an aspect of one's nature. However, that nature came about. There's some disagreements about the extent to which some social conditioning enters into the picture. And almost everybody now, I take it, agrees that there's no therapy that will change where one is located on the continuum. And so I think it's important to realize that we are at this point. Almost everybody agrees that nobody is to be blamed for being located on the homosexual end of that continuum. That's quite remarkable. Fifty years ago, that one would not have said that. Now, that said, many parents, as we all know, many parents, both Christian and non-Christian, still do find it difficult, in spite of that evidence, to accept that their child is gay. But almost all church leaders now say that persons with a homosexual orientation are to be accepted lovingly into the church. And that's true for the leaders of the Christian Reformed Church. And that's an important and striking development. Now this past January, a committee presented to Classes Grand Rapids East a report, a long report titled, Report on Biblical and Theological Support Currently Offered by Christian Proponents of Same-Sex Marriage. Not exactly a crisp title, but... <laughs> In my judgment, it's a really superb piece of work. And in the light of, human sexuality, of a picture of human sexuality that I've just now presented, the committee raises this question. Is same-sex attraction a disorder? Malformation, deformity, a disorder, a mark of the fallenness of creation? Or is it what the committee calls a creational variance? A disorder or a creational variance? So I think we should think about that question for a few minutes. Here are some analogs. Quite clearly, there is an inclination to steal continuum with people having no inclination to steal on one end of the continuum and serious kleptomaniacs on the other end of the continuum. 
And quite clearly, there's a tendency to a tendency to get angry continuum with people who almost never get angry on one end of the continuum, and people who fly into a rage over the smallest things on the other end of the continuum. Now, having a powerful inclination to steal and being easily angered are pretty clearly disorders, marks of the fallenness of creation. Those who have these disorders must do what they can to resist acting on them. And why are they disorders? Well, they're disorders because stealing is wrong. Blame them. As is flying into a rage over small things. And they're wrong because they violate the love command. If you really acted on the love command, you wouldn't fly into a rage of people over the time little things and so forth. Now the application. So those are disorders, okay? Being on the homosexual end of the sex, sexual orientation continuum doesn't seem to me a disorder like kleptomania and the tendency to fly into a rage over tiny, over tiny things. For those who have a homosexual orientation act on their desires in a loving, committed relationship, they are not, so far as I can see, <coughs> violating the love command, as you are when you steal and fly into a rage. To use the language of that uh, classical report, being on the homosexual end of the sexual orientation continuum seems to me to be a creational variance rather than a disorder. And let me say parenthetically that for the homosexual person that matters a great deal, a very great deal, whether you say to him or her that their orientation is a disorder, a mark of the fallenness of creation, or whether you say that their location on that spectrum is the creational variance, like every other location on the spectrum. Okay, so my views are changing along those lines. And at this point in the process of my views being changed, the question that began rattling around in my mind was this. If having a homosexual orientation is neither morally blamable, nor a disorder like kleptomania. And if accordingly, members of the church are to, accept, are to accept such people as they are, then why is it wrong for people with that orientation to act on their desires? If it's okay for persons with a heterosexual orientation to act on their desires, provided they do so in a loving covenantal relationship, then why is it wrong for those with a homosexual orientation to act on their desires? Not even if they do so lovingly in a covenantal relationship. Acting on their desires in a loving covenantal relationship is not, so far as I can see, a violation of the love command. So why is it nonetheless wrong for them to do so? That's the question that began rattling around in my mind, but, you know, I don't know, 15 years ago, 10. Now, of course, <laughs> I know that many dis Christians disagree with the conclusion <coughs> to which I found myself led, namely that homosexual orientation is not a disorder, but a creational variance. The CRC Declaration, Christian Reformed Church Declaration of 1973 explicitly calls it a disorder. Though it may not look like kleptomania or being hot-headed, the idea is nonetheless it is like those. It's a disorder, a mark of the fallenness of creation. It's a disorder because it's wrong to act on that orientation. Just as it's wrong to act on the impulse to steal and to fly off the handle. So far as I know, <clears throat> nobody who holds that view 
holds that homosexual activity is wrong because it is intrinsically unloving. Intrinsically a violation of the love of community. The reason given for holding that as a disorder is that scripture teaches that God says that homosexual activity is always wrong. And if God says it's wrong, it's wrong. Even when it's not a violation of the law of commands. Nonetheless, God says it's wrong. And if homosexual activity is wrong, then the orientation is a disorder, a malformation, a deformity that you've got to work to resist. Now, if God, if God does say it's always wrong, we'd want to know why God says that. I mean, think about it. Strange that God would say that it's wrong even though it doesn't violate the love command. But the prior question before we get to the why is whether God does in fact say it's always wrong. So at that point in my intellectual journey, I turned to scripture. So here goes. Some Bible study. So one feature of the Reformed tradition, of which I am truly proud, is that its leaders have always opposed proof texting. That is, have always opposed taking some biblical text out of context to support some position that you already hold. For example, supporting spanking children by quoting Proverbs, spare the rod and spoil the child. That's proof text. Biblical passages, our tradition has always insisted, are always to be interpreted in context. <clears throat> in spite of the opposition of the Reformed tradition to proof texting, it's my judgment that in the debate over homosexuality, there's been a lot of proof texting. <clears throat> Altogether, there are <clears throat> only seven texts in Scripture that speak of homosexual activity. That's remarkable. The Bible is a really long book. <laughs> and that long book is one of the topics least often discussed seven times, always in brief one sentence passages. Well, there are four such passages in the Old Testament. Two of them, one in Genesis, one in Judges, are reports of episodes in which a group of men threatened to commit gang homosexual rape. And the passages understandably <laughs> condemn the threat. Most commentators agree, as do I, that from these common <laughs> condemnations of gang homosexual rape, you can't draw conclusions about homosexual relations in general. The other two passages in the Old Testament come from Leviticus. Let me read them. Leviticus 18.22, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. NIV translates it as disgusting. I think, uh, I'm quoting NRS, the uh, revised standard, new standard, revised standard version here. I think abomination is, catches, catches it better than just disgusting. Leviticus 20.13 reads, if a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination, they shall be put to death. So now for the context. The context of those two passages is the holiness code that Moses delivered to Israel on behalf of God. Two things stand out in the holiness code. One thing very common, is that Israel is to follow God's rules for ritual cleanness and purification. The members of Israel are not, for example, to eat unclean animals. Pigs, eagles, eels, and flying insects are to be avoided, along with lots of other creatures of land, sea, and air. And several times over, I find this striking. Several times over, the members of Israel are instructed not to eat blood and not eat, to eat animals that have been strangled so that the blood is still in the animal. That's one thing. 
keep the rules of ritual cleanness and purification. The other thing that stands out in the holiness code is that Israel's way of living is to be sharply distinct from the practices of the Egyptians and the Canaanites. Leviticus 18, 2 through 3 reads, You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt, where you lived, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I am bringing you. So, for example, members of Israel are not to sow their fields with two kinds of seed. They are not to, make, they are not to wear garments made of two different kinds of material. They are not to eat fruit from the trees that they plant until five years after the trees have been planted. They are not to tattoo their bodies. And they are told at great length in Leviticus, not to, I'm going to quote the words, not to approach, not to approach anyone near of kin to uncover nakedness. And then the passage runs through brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, and so forth. Confronted with this wide-ranging holiness code of Leviticus, well, no. You and I eat pork. The Dutch are fond of eel, so am I. <laughs> Some of us here are wearing garments made of two or more kinds of material, including myself. There's wool and then there's something else on the inside. I think it's likely that some of you have tattoos. I don't. <laughs> we don't put to, get, put to death men who engage in homosexual activity. I could go on. What do you think? Seems to me that confronted with the wide ranging <laughs> holiness code of Leviticus, I submit that it's purely arbitrary to pluck out the condemnation of male homosexual relations and universalize that condemnation while ignoring almost, if not almost everything else, if not everything else that's forbidden. I just don't see how you can do it. So I don't see how these two passages, when interpreted in context, remember, not just isolated as proof text, can be used to support the view that God has said that homosexual activity and a loving covenantal relationship is wrong. So let's turn to the New Testament. Here there are three passages, just three. Concerning two of them, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 and 1 Timothy 1 verse 10, there are big disputes among the translators over the meaning of two rarely used Greek words in the original. And in fact, if you look at NRSV, and if you look at the two different versions of the NIV, you see that the translators have changed their minds as to how they should be translated. And so I agree with most translators that given the ambiguity of the rarely used words in Greek, yeah, these passages cannot be treated as decisive. I think everybody agrees that the decisive passage is what Paul says in Romans 1. So let's turn to Romans. I'm reading the NRSV translation here, but the NIV is not substantially different. Paul is speaking, he says, of idolaters. And this is what he says. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the degrading of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. For this reason, God gave them up to degrading passions. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural, and in the same, same way also the men, giving up natural intercourse with women, were consumed with passion for one another. Now that's where most people who discuss this passage stop. But here's how Paul continues, and I think it's crucial to allow Paul to speak his whole piece. Here's how it continues. 
Christians, and it's they, these idolaters, did not see fit to acknowledge God. God gave them up to a debased mind and to things that shouldn't be done. They were filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, craftiness. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, rebellious toward parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. That's the passage. And when you read the passage in its entirety, it pictures for us a truly appallingly wicked group of people. Truly appallingly wicked. Some commentators argue that what Paul is doing here is repeating a hyperbolic picture of Gentiles that was common among Jews of the day. That might be true, but then again, maybe Paul actually knew such a group of thoroughly depraved people. Either way, homosexual activity in the context of the perverted and wicked activity that Paul describes is clearly wrong. My guess is almost certainly these people were also engaging in perverted heterosexual behavior. But here's the question. Can we generalize from this passage? And say that Paul is teaching that God declares that homosexual activity is always wrong. There is night and day difference between the people that Paul describes and the committed same-sex couples that I know. They are not given up to degrading passions. They are not full of lust. They are not idolaters. They are not god haters Can we nonetheless, on the basis of this passage, infer that God says that what they're doing is wrong? Before we answer that question one way or another, maybe we should ask, what are we to make of the phrase, did you hear it? They exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural. Might it be that here at last we get what we've been looking for, an indication that God does forbid all homosexual activity, along with a hint as to God's reason for doing so. Does God forgive, forbid it because it's unnatural? I don't think we can draw that conclusion for two reasons. First, for a person with homosexual orientation, it's not unnatural, it's natural. If everybody's orientation were heterosexual, then homosexual activity would be unnatural. But we don't know that not everybody's orientation is heterosexual. And here's a second reason. There's another appeal by Paul in his letters to nature that is strikingly similar to his appeal to nature in the Romans passage that I just read. It's in 1 Corinthians 11, 14, where Paul says, quote, Does not nature itself teach you, nature itself teach you, that if a man wears long hair, it's degrading to him, but if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. The Greek word translated as degrading in that Corinthians passage is the same as the Greek word translated, or grammatical variant on the Greek word translated, translated as degrading in the Romans passage. What do you think? I think John Calvin had it right when he says in his commentary on this Corinthians passage that, and I'm quoting John Calvin now, what Paul calls natural is what was at that time in common use by universal consent and custom. So here's the conclusion to which I was led. When we look at the context of Paul's condemnation of homosexual behavior in the first chapter of Romans, and not just at the isolated proof text, Maybe the context is homosexual behavior is among the activities of an, of an appallingly wicked group of idolaters. Uh, I don't see that.
seeing how we can generalize to the conclusion that God forbids homosexual activity in the very different, in the profoundly different context of a loving covenantal relationship. So let me summarize what I've said so far. I'm reporting my own change of views. I explained that I was drawn to the conclusion that being located toward the homosexual end of the sexual orientation continuum represents neither moral blame nor disorder. And I said that if it's neither blameable nor a disorder, like kleptomania, now, I don't see why it's okay for heterosexual people to act on their natural desires of orientation and wrong for homosexual people to do so. I then consider the response that though homosexual orientation may not look to us like a disorder, but it, like a creational variance, it is in fact a disorder because scripture teaches that God has declared that homosexual activity is always wrong even within a covenantal relationship. So I turned to scripture to find out whether God has indeed declared this. And to repeat, I preface my comment, my comments with the observation that as with all biblical texts, we have to consider the text in context and not treat it as an isolated proof text. And when we look at the Leviticus passage, in context, passages are true, we saw that male homosexual activity was part of the whole complex of Egyptian and Canaanite practices that the Holiness Code of Israel instructed Israel to separate itself from. Other such practices being getting tattooed, eating pork or veal, and wearing garments made of two different kinds of material. And when we looked at the Romans passage in context, the picture was of an of an appallingly wicked group of idolaters. And I then said that, I don't know about you, but I don't see how we can responsibly move from these highly specific condemnations to generalization. Parenthesis. <laughs> Let me say a word about the mode of scripture interpretation that I've just now employed with you. It's often said by those who support a traditional interpretation of these passages that we must not allow social and cultural trends to influence our interpretation of Scripture. Now, I find that thesis dubious in general. In the first place, the Reformed tradition has never regarded new developments in society and culture as all inherently bad. In an eloquent passage in, the, in Calvin's Institutes, 2.2.15, he says that often the Spirit of God is at work in secular culture. He talks specifically about ancient Greek culture and ancient Roman culture. And second, when you and I look back over history, we see the developments in society and culture have in fact often influenced biblical interpretation in ways that we, looking back, regard as good. And slavery, I suppose, is the principal example of that. But be all that as it may, should we allow developments in culture and society to shape scriptural interpretation? I haven't done that. I have not interpreted these passages with the goal in mind of having it turn out that they're compatible with certain contemporary social and cultural developments. Instead, what I did is I asked, when we look at these passages in context, can we responsibly generalize to an absolutely general condemnation of homosexual activity? And I said, I don't see how we can. And that's not appealing to social and cultural trends. It's <laughs> looking at the context. Here's my view. I think that even the person who thinks that some homosexual activity is always wrong for, for some reason or other, even that person cannot responsibly appeal to these passages to support his position. He's going to have to find some other support. 
So I wondered whether I should say this next sentence, but I will. I reluctantly, no, using these passages to support their position is resting scripture to serve one's own purpose. I reluctantly conclude, this is what I wondered whether I should say, that that's what the traditionists in this case have been doing, resting scripture to serve their own purposes. What about marriage? Commitment to a loving covenantal relationship is one thing. Marriage is another. It's often said that marriage down through the ages has, be, has been between one man and one woman. Justice Scalia made that declaration in his dissent to the U.S. court decision on uh, permitting same-sex marriage throughout the, uh, throughout the country. Now, as many writers have pointed out, there, is, there has, in fact, been enormous variability throughout history in what is regarded as marriage or its equivalent. By no means has it always been limited to one man and one woman. What is the case, so far as I know, I'm going to be corrected, is that there have seldom been same-sex marriages. But rather than dwelling on that item of history, I think the thing that you and I should do here is that we should look closely at what constitutes civil marriage and ask whether justice requires the civil marriage be opened up to same-sex couples. And once we've done that, then we should look closely at church or ecclesial marriage and ask whether justice requires a church or ecclesial marriage be opened up to same-sex couples. Now, as to civil marriage, I'm going to say next to nothing. Just this. Civil marriage consists of a couple taking on to themselves a really thick complex in our society of civil rights and responsibilities. And I think justice requires that same-sex couples be allowed to take on to themselves a same complex, thick complex of civil rights and responsibilities. So let me speak just a bit more expansively about church or ecclesial marriage. Uh, the, Last time the Christian Reformed Church revised its form for the solemnization of marriage was in 1979. So that's sort of the last official. Here's what it says about Christian marriage. I think I'm going to read it twice. <laughs> if marriage is to be pleasing in the sight of God, those who enter into this covenant of life must share a common commitment to the Lord of life. In putting his blessing on a marriage, God intended that it would provide, and then we get a list of four goods, a context within which husband and wife can help and comfort each other and find companionship, a setting within which we may give loving and tender expression to the desires God gave us, a secure environment within which children may be born and taught to know and serve the Lord, and a structure that enriches society and contributes to its orderly function. Let me read them again. A context within which husband and wife can help and comfort each other and find companionship. A setting within which we may give loving and tender expression to the desires God gave us. A secure environment within which children may be born and taught to know and serve the Lord. And fourth, a structure that enriches society and contributes to its orderly function. When these purposes are prayerfully pursued in union with Christ, the kingdom of God is advanced and the blessedness of husband and wife assured. Now that's very brief, but I think it's a pretty good summary of the fundamental goods of marriage, don't you? And did you notice that a same-sex couple can provide, provide or exhibit all of them except for the first part of the third, namely a secure environment within which children may be born? But the fact that the church marries couples who are beyond childbearing age <laughs> indicates that it does not regard procreation or the possibility of procreation as essential 
I'll say it again, all the other goods mentioned can be provided or exhibited by same-sex couples. I don't know about you, but here's the conclusion to which I feel led. Given those goods, I think justice requires that the church be willing to marry those same-sex couples who are committed to a loving covenantal relationship. Once one says that a homosexual orientation is no more culpable or disordered than a heterosexual orientation, and once one discerns that scripture does not teach that God says that homosexual activity is always wrong, I think we've got to conclude that justice requires that the church offer the great good of marriage to heterosexual, both to heterosexual couples committed to a loving covenantal relationship and to homosexual couples so committed. In closing, let me say just a word about biblical justice, since that figures prominently in my title. <laughs> <laughs> Though you have probably guessed by now that Art Youngsma asked me to provide a title for this poem long before I knew what I was going to say. <laughs> Christian scripture does speak repetitively about justice. We are told that God loves justice and that we are to imitate God in doing justice. In thinking about these scriptural declarations, it's important to distinguish between what I call first order justice, on the one hand, and corrective or retributive justice. Corrective justice consists of punishments, reprimands, reparations, and so forth. It becomes relevant when somebody is wrong, somebody. First order justice consists of all the other ways in which we treat each other justly or unjustly. How teachers treat students, and how students treat teachers. How parents treat children, and how children treat parents how merchants treat customers, and how customers treat merchants, and so forth. And to repeat this one, there's been a breakdown in that kind of justice, that the second order of corrective justice becomes relevant. Now I've learned, to my surprise, I guess, that most Christians, when they hear the phrase, God's justice, think of God's punishment of the sinner. <coughs> and I don't understand really why that is. But when scripture declares that I, the Lord, love justice, that's not what the writers have in mind. They're not saying God loves punishing people. What they're saying is, what they're talking about is God's love among human beings, love of justice among human beings. And prior, primarily what they have in mind is God's love of first order justice among human beings. Yes, God wants a well-functioning punishment system, properly functioning, justly functioning. But primarily it's how people in society treat each other. You probably notice that a striking feature of how justice is spoken of in scripture is that over and over justice is connected with how widows, orphans, aliens, the impoverished, the homeless, and prisoners are treated. <coughs> over and over. I think quite clearly the thought is that these are the ones who are most vulnerable to being wronged. Most vulnerable to being treated unjustly in ancient society and in our society. Immigrants, prisoners. And accordingly, if that's right, if they're the most vulnerable, then in our struggle for justice, they should be given priority. And in our society, as in many, if not most societies, those with a homosexual orientation are clearly among those who are most vulnerable to being wrong. Can we say in a word what treating justly the vulnerable members of society consists of. Scripture doesn't give a formula. 
And I think quite clearly the idea is that these people are being deprived of a fair share in the life and the goods of the, of the community. And another idea, quite often alluded to, is that these people are not being treated with due honor. They are being demeaned. Once the point is called to your attention, you would be struck by how often scripture speaks of honoring people and not demeaning them. In first, first chapter of 1 Peter, the author says, honor everybody, which would have been utterly remarkable in ancient society. People honored the people above them. But Peter says, Everybody is to honor everybody. So in short, the position to which I've gradually been led is that having a homosexual orientation is neither blameworthy nor a disorder. And accordingly, so far as I can see, justice requires that such persons be granted the great good of civil and ecclesial marriage. I have not come to these conclusions lightly. I realize that the entire Christian church has traditionally been of the opposite view. And I am one who honors the tradition of the church. But I've described how I've been led in this case to depart from tradition, which as I was led some years back, to depart from the tradition on the matter of the ordination of women. Thank you very much for your attention. I had a ton of questions going through my mind, but you answered them all. Oh, well, it's always been my policy to try to leave some unanswered questions. <laughs> <laughs> so we did spread some cards around. There's not enough for everyone. If you have a card in your hand and you are not thinking about using it, then please share it with someone who would like to write a question. And we have two persons, one in each aisle who will collect these cards. In the meantime, I do have a question for you. Um, is there room for disagreement? You know, you honor the tradition of the church, and there are biblical scholars in the Christian Reformed Church who disagree with you strongly. Yep. Yes. Should we have, should we have sort of a congregationalist attitude about this? Or is scripture too clear about this is a matter of justice so that we are not the congregationalists, let's say, married? So, so I don't want to come across as a know-it-all. I said that at the beginning. Um, I've basically just described how I've been led to my current positions. I think they're correct. <laughs> but I think at this point in the discussion, there should be open discussion about the issues. And, uh, you know, I do, ins <laughs> I do insist on this. If we're going to appeal to, when we do, not yet, when we do appeal to the scripture passages, we must read them in context. I think that's non-negotiable. Um, that's what your and my tradition has insisted on. So, so let's read them in context. And if you think I've missing, if we together read them in context, and you think I've misinterpreted them, or or it's less clear than I think it is, fair enough. But but I do think reading them in context is um, sort of non-negotiable. Um, that sounds pretty authoritarian, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, our tradition has been so adamantly against proof texting, as it's been called, but 
but we slide into it all the time. Mm -hmm. So, okay, thank you. I'm not going to ask, but I've got some of you have tattoos, right? I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Why does this topic raise so much more dissension than other sins, such as greed, injustice towards the poor, or other vulnerable populations? Oh, I, I mean, I, I think the answer to that is sexuality strikes so deep into what we are as human beings, into, into, our, into our very character, our very nature. It's not just actions, but that is, that that's why it, it's much more controversial, anxiety-producing, and so forth, um, whether women can be ordained and so forth. But if you look at scripture, as I say, there are these seven passages about homosexual activity, and there are goodness knows how many about the poor and the greediness and the thundering accusations of Amos and Isaiah and so forth. In the CRC form for marriage, there is a statement that, quote, in marriage as instituted by God, a man and a woman covenant to live together in a lifelong exclusive partnership of love and fidelity. How do you approach the assumption that marriage is instituted by God as between a man and a woman, though there are many social forms this heterosexual relationship has taken? I assume that what was going through the mind of those who wrote the 79 form for the solemnization of marriage was the biblical passages. Their interpretation of the biblical passages, almost certainly that's what was going through the mind. Mm -hmm. okay. Dr. Henry Staub said. <laughs> <laughs> late professor of moral theology, defined biblical justice as what we owe another and not, first of all, what the law or justice owes to us. Is this way of thinking God's love for people of faith? Let's see, I want to make sure I get this right. Is this a way of thinking God's love commandment with his call for people of faith to do justice toward the human family. I think, I, did you get it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's, I, I agree with that form in a way of thinking about justice. Justice pertains to what we owe each other. It pertains to the legitimate moral claims that we have on one another. Then you can distinguish between legal justice and moral justice, but but moral justice is the basic, it's, 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 yeah, it's what we owe one another. So justice and obligation are flip sides of the same. He uses the language owe in there, obligation. Justice and obligation are opposite sides of the same point, as, as I see it. And so, it's, and so that's, I, I mentioned that, um, I said, do we see a pattern a way of thinking about justice in scripture, even though there's not a formula. And I said, well, many times what comes to the surface is what's required for honoring the person. And that's that's connected to, if you owe something to somebody, it's because there's something praiseworthy about the person, something that calls for honor. Why are the passages in the Bible if they don't mean what they seem to say? <laughs> Oh, I, my view is that they do mean what they say. If you read them in context. <laughs> Sometimes I find troubling that the way we're invited to understand what God desires from the way you understand Scripture, why he would allow such passages in in the first place. If it doesn't fit, you know. <laughs> So scripture is an ex Christian scripture is probably the most extraordinarily complex book uh, of any. And it's got all these different varieties of literature in it. And they each have to be read in their own way. Um, there are parables, so there, there is history. Um, there is story. 
Proverbs. And uh, uh, Proverbs has these pithy little, pithy little sayings, for example. So, yes, when you and I are reared to read modern novels and contemporary newspapers, we have not thereby acquired all the skills for reading Christian scripture. <laughs> how do we decide with all these prohibitions that you were you yeah. Were, yeah how do we decide which laws still apply the dietary laws were explicitly put aside in the New Testament. Arguably, the sexual laws were not ramped up, for example, lost in your heart. Couldn't we argue that we keep the sexual prohibitions as a whole? If not, how can we oppose bestiality and incest between consenting adults? Yeah, so um, in Acts 15, we have a report of the Jerusalem Council. Um, Paul, and, Paul had been doing missionary, Paul and Peter had been doing missionary work among the Gentiles. And there were some people back in Jerusalem who were alarmed that they were not requiring the converts to be circumcised. So there's this big council. Looks as if there was a heated debate there. The council comes out saying that idolatry is forbidden. Uh, sexual immorality is forbidden, but it does not say what constitutes sexual immorality. And it says that eating blood is forbidden. I mean, that's a really interesting one. You know. um, and it says that eating meat sacrificed to idols is forbidden. Now, clearly, a lot more things are forbidden than, than those four that happened to be mentioned there. Uh, but, as, but as we know, a dispute then arose later in Paul's churches as to whether it really was necessary that people not eat meat sacrificed to idols. And then Paul says, well, in effect, use, use charity and judgment on that. And if somebody is offended, then don't do it, but it's not intrinsically wrong. So I don't, so, um, so that gives us a bit of a clue, but once again, um, it's a mixture of don't eat blood. <coughs> The Germans love blood burst, right? Uh, so, so what the church has, uh, has done over the years is just patiently sort of work through, um, work through those, through that thick tangle of um, items in the holiness book. Is it consistent if God's If reading out of context is non-negotiable, then shouldn't it also be non-negotiable to treat others unjustly? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an absolute. Never treat anybody unjustly. That's a, never. And then how does the despicable a person is treated with respect? Yes, and the reason for that is every, every human being, no matter how despicable they have acted, nonetheless retain the image of God. And on that account, have some worth and dignity that must be honored. So there are some things, even the worst human being, some things that must never be done for them. To play it safe, they must, you must not use torture as an instrument of punishment. I doubt that anybody just disputes that. I think I've gone through them all, except the one I could read. Okay. okay. It says, read it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Is it consistent with God's justice for God to create some same-sex orientation, but then provide, prohibit them from flourishing? Um, I can't even get one. For, for, you know, just from flourishing. So yeah, um, that was basically my argument. But, but I said, well, I'm willing, to, I'm willing to consider the person who says, we may, we may not see the why, but, but Scripture says that in fact, God declares it to be universally wrong. And that's, that's why I 
then you and I have to, in fact, look at the, look at the biblical passages. Even though we find it inscrutable that God would declare that it was intrinsically wrong, let's look at the passages which people appeal to. Okay. I'm going to finish with one last question here, or I guess there's more than one on this card. Okay. And then we'll have uh, refreshments. How do you effectively engage this conversation with someone who finds homosexual action as morally reprehensible as a disorder? Yes. <laughs> Last week. In Baylor, uh, Baylor University. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well. <laughs> So he gave me the example that he was in, <laughs> that he was in fact somebody who flew off the handle very easily. So when I gave the spectrum of this anger spectrum, I had that Baylor philosophy professor in mind who said that. <laughs> okay. But, that, but then we agreed when we talked it out that. Yeah, he agreed that that was, in fact, a disorder. That, that it was not just a neutral spectrum, but that it was a disorder. He had, had to work at trying to restrain himself. Okay. Okay. Um, Thank you very much. Um, I'm Cheryl Baldwin, president of the 